Well, this seems to be Legends Week. You're going to meet another legend today. Day number 322, my guest is Michael Chesley Johnson. Michael, welcome to the show with no name. Thank you, Eric. Good to see you, you again. What are you going to do today? Well, I'm going to take a field sketch and scale it up into a larger studio painting. Oh, that's cool. So a, a field sketch would be like a plein air painting, for those who yes. might not know. And and that's I find that to be very difficult. So I think this is going to be good because I find that when I paint something small, I try to make it big. I just have trouble. I struggle with it. Why don't we get right into it? Sounds good. Okay. okay. I'm going to put you on full screen. You can adjust your camera. And okay. uh, so go Sounds ahead. Good. Sounds good. Uh, what I've been doing this past year during the pandemic is uh, going out into my backyard. Basically, it's a small canyon that uh, has some nice ponderosa pines and just a real quiet space. And I go out there for my my mental sanity, basically. And uh, so every day I've been going out doing gouache sketches. I've been using uh, small sketchbooks like this. This is a, um, a Pentelic Aqua Journal and doing little sketches like this and having a lot of fun with... Uh, with the trees and the canyon colors and so forth. So what I thought I'd do today is take this sketch right here and scale it up into something a bit larger than that. Uh, so we'll put this away. Now, for those who might not know, gouache is a, a water-based medium that is more opaque than watercolor. Now, what what kind of a, what are you gonna use uh, for your larger painting? Well, what I'm gonna do today is use, uh, I'm using oil. And okay. what I like to do often is take a um, take a different medium from whatever I use in the field. So, for example, if I go out and do pastel, I might come back to the studio and use oil. If I use oil in the field, I might come back and do pastel. Uh, in this case, I've been using gouache in the field. And I've been having a lot of fun taking the gouache sketches and turning them to oil paintings. So that's what I'm doing th today. The... Um, the paintings that I do out in the field are about uh, five by eight inches. This is a, uh, a photocopy or a scan of what you just saw in the sketchbook. Um, and what I want to do is scale that up a bit into a nice design. And what I've found over the years is that um, I have really moved away from painting in standard formats, uh, 12 by 16, 9 by 12, and so forth. So what I like about this uh, sketch I did is that it has a certain proportion to it. And I tried to replicate that on a larger surface. So this is a uh, 14 by 18 uh, hardboard with a couple of layers of acrylic gesso on it. And I didn't want to use the whole 14 by 18 because it's not the same proportions as this uh, smaller piece. So what I did was figured out where I had to mark this off. And this piece of tape here marks the location at the bottom of that, um, of that scene. All right. and you can see, yeah, and you can see some of the um, the grid I put up. So transfer. let me ask you a tough question. Sure. All right. So is it better to cut the canvas or the board in this case before you do the painting or after? Because I would think, you know, putting a, you know, putting a finished painting through a saw might have some other issues like dust and so on. Yeah. Yeah, I don't use a saw. What I use is a uh, basically like an X-Acto knife or a, um, a sharp or a box cutter. And okay. I, take a, um, I take a metal ruler. And what I do is, I if this were the metal ruler, I'd put it right down to the edge there and cover the finished surface of the painting so I don't damage it. And then I'd cut along this line, scoring it carefully multiple times to break through um, this board, which is pretty easy to cut, actually. All right. You okay. have to be careful, though, if that uh, blade slips, which I've done before, I've taken off part of a pinky. Oh, my. Uh, so there you have it. Yeah. So anyway, this is the uh, the basic design here that I've created on just with some vine charcoal, which I like because it's easy to erase. It doesn't set, tend to muddy up the paint too much. Uh, what I'm going to use for color today is I've been working with a limited palette. So um, I'm using Hansa Yellow White. Naphthal red, alizarin crimson, Prussian blue, and yellow ochre, plus right. white, of course. Well, so this now, gives would, you, would you explain your grid? Because I think there are a lot of people who might not know about gridding. Okay. Yeah, what you do if you want to transfer a, um, a small sketch and scale it up is you have to divide your original 
uh, piece into a grid. So I've chosen uh, three by, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six grid, three by six. And on my chosen finished painting surface, I've put the same grid, only larger format. So it's still three by six, as you see here. Um, there are a couple of tricks you can do to make this easier for yourself. If you know this is a certain number of inches, you don't have to divide it by six to get the dimension of each one of these. You can take a, uh, a ruler, which I don't have right here, but you can, um, if this were a ruler, say, marked off in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on, you can say, well, I want to take something that's easily divisible by, uh, by six. So maybe you have 12, and you can t put your zero mark here and your 12 here. You just have to slide it until the 12 hits that edge. And that gives you the ability to say, okay, every two inches on this, one, two, three, four, five, six, and just draw vertical lines. That'll give you the breakdown that you need for that. And you do the same thing on your finished surface. I know it's kind of complicated and it probably requires a whole another video to, to demonstrate that, but it's a very easy way to not have to make a lot of fussy calculations to divvy up your space. Right. Well, that way your, your drawing ends up in the exact same place. So you, you look, you look within each square and yeah. you make sure that your shapes are the same. Exactly. Like this square here has this little uh, yellow green highlight and I've taken the same square here and if, this is where my little yellow green highlight's going to go. All right. And what That's very does is it get, yeah, it gives you accurate placement of all your shapes. So if you've spent a lot of time working out a design and you have to transfer it, you don't have to um, make errors or rethink it. You've already done your work here and you can just transfer it very easily to this. You know, I think that's fascinating because you've been probably been painting for a long, long time and yet you're still doing that. I would, I, I would have assumed that you would have just gone in freehand and, and drawn it out. I find that when I'm transferring from small to big, if I go in and freehand it out, I somehow always get it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I find the same thing where I'll make this too far down or too far over or something like that. And it just really plays havoc with your design. Um, when I'm in the field, usually, uh, you know, just looking at the sketch I did originally, I'm not paying a lot of attention to the design. I'm not going in with things like golden ratios and whatnot, trying to figure out where things go. I sort of approach it more intuitively. Um, I am thinking somewhat of the rule of thirds, where you think of a third and a third and a third, so forth, and maybe something shows up at the intersection of those lines. Um, but more often than not, I'm just kind of winging it. And then once I get back to the studio, if I feel the design needs more work, I'll spend considerable time you know, trying different thumbnails, different proportions of uh, vertical to horizontal and so on. So I come up with something that's pleasing. Um, in this case, I was pretty happy with the design. So I didn't have to do anything to really change that. I just liked it well enough. I decided to transfer it totally to the, uh, the finished surface as is. So uh, I've got our design placed here. And I've got my colors laid out. And I like to start off with um, a big brush. And what I'm going to do is I uh, just wet my big brush a little bit with some mineral spirits. I'm using um, Gamblin's um, uh, Gamsol. And one thing about this, this um, painting is that these, these highlight area here is are very, very intense. And I achieved that with gouache by applying the gouache transparently. So it acts more like a watercolor. Gouache, as you remember, is an opaque medium. Watercolor is transparent. So by making the uh, gouache very thin, it acts more like watercolor and has more of a stained glass effect where the light going down into it bounces back off the white background and through that, uh, that thin glaze of color. So, so was that a multiple glazes or was that? No, that's just, just like, once. This really? was white paper. And at the very end, I just popped in some yellow and maybe a little bit of green, but it uh, basically gives you that... Um, that stained glass like effect and it glows more than it would have if I tried to apply uh, opaque gouache right on top of it. So normally with uh, oil painting, what you do is you start off with the dark areas and work your way toward the lights. In this case, however, I want to kind of preserve some of these uh, light yellow areas like we just talked about with the gouache and apply the paint transparently. So rather than 
making a mess with the really dark paint and possibly intruding too much into these areas, I'm going to just apply a thin bit of uh, yellow, more or less transparent paint there. Looks kind of greenish, doesn't it? Which is not a bad thing. And I'll leave this more transparent area until the very end and I might put in a little um, opaque color on top of it. What's is happening there any here way is that we can prop your sketchbook off to the side or something so we can see your reference. Mm -hmm. Or maybe well, you can, maybe you can tape it right off to the side or something. Yeah, let's see. Maybe I could slide this just a little. Uh, you've got plenty of room on the left on the left or or the yeah, you it'd be yeah. better if you just tape it onto the left. Yeah, left side would be good. Or right. have a clip or something. Sorry mm -hmm. about that, guys. I want to tell everybody while he's doing that, that uh, uh, we have some prizes today. The prize today is a digital subscription to Plein Air magazine, which is great. If you're international, it's great because then you can get the magazine. And the digital has 20% more content than the, the uh, print edition, number one selling art magazine in America. The winner of the Easel Brush Clip from easelbrushclip.com is Artie Ross from Arizona. Congratulations, Artie. All right. Thank you, Michael, for doing that. I think that'll make a big diff. Yep. You see that better? Yep. That works. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just looking at these light yellow areas, yellow green, applying just a little thin paint, my Hansa yellow light, just to make a note of where some of these will be. And I will leave this kind of thin and transparent until the end. And then we'll fuss with it a little bit if we need any opacity. Okay. I'm a big I'm a big believer in massaging color. So uh, some painters will mix exactly what they need right off the bat and apply it and leave it alone. I don't do that. Um, I don't have the patience for it. And outdoors, I found actually that um, if I make my best guess at making these color mixtures, I can always adjust it in the next phase, especially because I'm using fairly absorbent surfaces. And that first layer of paint tends to stay down exactly where you want it to be. So the next thing I want to do is go ahead and continue on this tree shape here and think about what's happening with some of the dark areas down here. We've established these light spots. And I'm going to take a little Prussian blue and a little yellow ochre, make a real dark greenish mixture, and start working some of that in. I tend to scrub a lot um, just to get the color in. And this is probably too dark, but this is my best guess stage. That makes a beautiful green, yellow ochre and Prussian blue. Yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, I used um, ultramarine blue and cobalt blue for many years. And I started playing with Prussian blue for some reason. And I just love it. It's a nice... Uh, it's a nice cold blue that's great for shadow passages and makes some really beautiful greens with um, with um, a variety of yellows and oranges. You just, you just don't want to get it in a cut. If it gets into a cut, <laughs> it, it, it you can get poisoned very quickly. Oh, yeah. I, I did uh, not know. Yeah, I had somebody in a class one time. They got a little Prussian in their finger on a cut. And... Uh, they came back the next week, and their their hand was the size of a football. And I said, go to the ER right now. And they said, oh, no, no, no. And I said, no, go right now. And they went, and they said, you probably would have been dead in 24 hours because they had poisoned themselves. I thought you were going to say something more innocuous, like don't get it in your in your fabric of your upholstery of your car or something. Oh, yeah. Well, that stuff's deadly when it comes to that. I mean, you'll <laughs> never get that staining out. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty uh, vicious color. Okay, but I'm going to make it makes some great mixtures. Mixing it with an Indian red, mm -hmm. beautiful, makes good, beautiful, distant mountain colors. Yeah. Yeah, I find it uh, it's just more satisfying than ultramarine blue. Ultramarine blue has that sort of a purplish red cast. And uh, especially out here in the Southwest, I'm in New Mexico at about 7,000 feet, it just doesn't quite cut it. Okay, I'm mixing a little alizarin crimson into this green mixture just to get some dark darks established here. But one thing I like to think about too, um, I like to think about dominance in paintings. Uh, one of the first things I ask myself when I'm outside 
is what's dominant in the scene with respect to um, with uh, value. Is it is the scene mostly dark? Is it mostly light? And also with color temperature, is it mostly warm or most, mostly cool? Uh, so this scene that we're looking at here, I would say, even though you had these bounced um, reflected lights in here, I would say the scene is mostly cool and mostly dark. That's something I try to remember as I go. In fact, you can see I wrote it down here and forgot to mention it. Um, now I've got some nice dark masses on either side here. And let's move back into this area. This is a fairly um, rich, warm, yellowish kind of color. The uh, photo here, the scan isn't quite true to my gouache. Another important thing to think about uh, with this whole process of going from field to studio is that if you paint something in one medium and then you take it back to the studio for more, for creating a larger version of it or a different version of it, and if you switch mediums, you'll find yourself being forced to make different color choices. Uh, so with gouache, for example, I have a fairly intense gouache palette. The colors are just just hallucinogenic sometimes, which is nuts. Maybe so that's the mushrooms you've been eating. It'd be. We're, we're growing some sprouts now, which are kind of fun to see hatch. But the... Um, the gouache is gonna be different from the oil paint or different from the pastel, whichever medium you happen to be working in. Uh, so you find yourself making different color choices. And I find that really revs up the uh, whole excitement for the process of working in the studio. Uh, frankly, working in the studio is not my favorite thing to do, uh, unless I can make changes like that, where I change up the medium, change up the size, play with the design, screw around with things a little bit until I get something that I like. Um, so, okay, now i got a nice rich red here, but I don't know how that relates to anything else. I can see that it's working well compared to this. It's definitely darker than this light uh, green sunlit area and a little lighter than the, um, the shadowy greens here, but I don't know if this is the right amount of glow that I want that I can see in the, um, the reference. So what I want to do is go ahead and surround that block of reddish color with some of these other colors and values to see what um, what the effect is. I want to say hi to people as they leave comments. Make sure you say where you're from. Uh, hello, Athens, Greece. Wow. Hello, uh, Barrie, Canada. Let's see, British Columbia. Uh, we got people all over the United States. I usually don't mention them, but uh, I'm glad you're here. Mm -hmm. um, saw somebody from... Uh, Oh, gosh, somewhere else. It was pretty cool. I'll keep looking. Sorry to interrupt you. That's right. It's nice to hear about all the people we have watching. Oh, yeah. you got a nice size audience today. And uh, France, welcome. You guys, we love hearing from where you're from. And we love it when you hit the share button so that your friends can discover great artists like this who are on every day at noon. So this was a quick block in of kind of a bluish green, somewhat grayed down. Uh, I was using the Prussian blue, a little yellow ochre, and a little bit of my naphthol red, just to see how this compares to that. And right now I can see that this is probably still a little too dark. We have to lighten it up at some point, especially since I'm going to probably lighten this up a little bit at some point. Um, but anyway, we've got some nice color down and I'll move on to this area using uh, something similar, maybe a little bluer, uh, maybe more in the purple zone. So a little bit of naphthol red and Prussian blue. Could be a little redder. Could be a little redder. Hello, Bulgaria, Sofia, Bulgaria, and Netherlands, Edmonton, Alberta. You guys, thank you for tuning in. One question I often get is, uh, do I tone my canvases before I start painting? Uh, my rule of thumb is if it's uh, nine by 12 or smaller, I usually don't, because I like just blocking in each area selectively. Uh, for larger paintings, I'll often give the canvas some kind of a tone first, um, just so I don't have little white spots showing through like this. Uh, but in this case, 
I'm not going to worry about it. It, yeah. it feels like you're, you're doing a pretty much a kind of a dry brushing. It doesn't look like there's a lot of fluidity to your paint. Is that correct? Or am I missing that? That's correct. The, um, the surface is very absorbent. It's basically hardboard with a, um, a layer of two of, um, Oh, gesso. So hardboard meaning like a masonite, something like that? Yes, like masonite. And um, it, it tends to really suck the uh, liquid out of the brush. And I kind of like the um, the more of a dry brush approach. Yeah. I don't know if you're all familiar with uh, Nikolai Fetchin, but I just love his work. Um, he was mostly a portrait artist and figure painter. Um, but he just has a really beautiful technique the very dry brush in fact he used to spread his paints out on newsprint to get most of the oil out before he'd start painting really you're lucky because you're in new mexico you can visit the museum the fashion museum yeah if you ever have a chance anyone it's just a really spectacular place fetchin was also quite the, the uh wood craftsman he spent a lot of time uh actually doing a lot of the interiors of his house you know hand carving wood uh, making scroll work, furniture, and so on. That studio is to die for. It's just beautiful. It is. Okay. And now we're getting somewhere. Now that I put this darker value here, this is beginning to glow a bit more. It's got that, um, that glow that I like. It's fairly transparent, too. You can almost take your finger and rub right through it. So uh, I think what I'm going to do is get this area next. This is sunlit rock surface and um, I'm going to take some white put a little napfall red in now napfall red is a neat color it's um, it's my replacement for the cadmiums for the cadmium reds I'm trying to stay away from toxic things except of course from Prussian blue so this is a, it becomes very cold when you add white to it so I'm going to add a little bit of my uh, yellow Hansa yellow light which is my replacement for um, cadmium yellow light and you can see if I add a little of that to it just warms it up ever so slightly just to give it more of a sunny glow so ultimately I might shoot for something like that but I don't want to go that warm and rich just yet I'd rather keep things a little on the cool side and add those other um, highlights later but this will get the rock laid in all right this is an overhang in the canyon behind my studio. Um, it's just basically a rock wall, sheer rock wall with uh, this ledge above it. And I just love the shadows that are cast. Have you given your rock wall a name? Like I have Norman rock wall? Norman rock wall? <laughs> no. Your wall? Sorry. I, I couldn't resist. No, it's quite all right. <laughs> But we have, we call it Trina's Canyon. Trina's my wife. And uh, so we, that's what we're calling it. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. And this is part of it. It's called Bathtub Canyon, actually, which is uh, the very end of it, which is like, well, it's like a bathtub. Now, one thing I want to do before I get too far is just add a note of some really dark color where these cracks are appearing in the rock wall. So I'm going to take a little um, uh, Prussian blue, a little napfall red which makes a nice dark purple and just see what happens if i take this and just slide it across into the shadow something like that it's important that these shadows cut in or these crack shadows cut into the cast shadow by that overhang because that gives you a sense of what's happening with the form of um of that rock wall you're a good teacher. Thank you. I enjoy doing it. It's uh, it's fun to see what other people do in the field, and I like helping people out. You want to tell us briefly about your book? I have it on the screen, Outdoor Study to Studio, Take Your Plein Air Paintings to the Next Level. How do we get it? Well, it's available on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and search on my name, you'll find it. Uh, you can also uh, go to my website. Uh, mchesleyjohnson.com and under the books and videos section you'll find it there and basically it's a book that helps you with your uh, 
both your outdoor painting and your studio work. It shows a number of different techniques, including this one of um, taking a small field sketch in one medium and making it bigger in a different medium. I have to admit, I'm a little guilty of picking up the knife and not putting it down sometimes. Um, once I get the knife, there's a lot of interesting stuff that can happen, defining forms and things. So since I've got the knife in my hand, I'll just go ahead and put in some of these darker accents. I'm getting a little reflection of my eyes on it, but maybe you have a slightly better view of things. Let's go down here and see what's happening with that. Okay. Now let's go to the top and start filling in some of that area. It's just kind of a grayed down bluish, grayish color with red, yellow, green, all the colors of the rainbow are back there. They're just all very grayed down, maybe a little lighter. This is a distant area. We don't really care about uh, what it is exactly. It's just a background area. I see on work. Amazon that you have two or three books out. Yeah. Yeah, Out Outdoor Study Studio is the latest one. Um, my primer for those who are just getting into planner painting is Backpack Your Painting, Outdoors with Oil and Pastel. I've also got some videos out there. Um, I'm going to be at the planner convention in May. See how this is starting to glow now, that little area? Yeah, well, you got contrast against it. Yeah, it's also the uh, the transparency of the, um, uh, the paint really right. helps quite a bit with that, too. Let's make a little more of a cool green to stick back there. Something like that, just a little lighter. Yeah. There's, there's some green vegetation back here somewhere in the world. Dennis Marshall says that you also have an excellent blog to read, so everybody Thank can you. go to the website to find that out. Thank you. Okay. okay, this is working pretty well. It's just a big dark mass with some lights on it. This is working okay. Need to fix that a little bit. Um, let's go in with some greens. The question is, will you have copies of the book at Pace? Um, we oftentimes make arrangements with our artists to put their books in our bookstore, mm -hmm. uh, but just go ahead and order it. Get it now so you don't forget. Yeah, if, if you want, bring it and I'll sign it. That's actually easier. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, nothing like having to ship a bunch of books. <laughs> You'll probably drive. Yeah, I probably will, although I'm thinking about flying maybe. It's not a... It's uh, like a six-hour drive from where I live, maybe seven, but a quick plane hop from Albuquerque. Um, By the time you drive to the airport? Yeah, well, exactly. You know, it's about, probably about the same. Yeah, maybe so. I don't know. I just don't want to get on airplanes these days. Yeah. Or I'll fly I've by got... May, everything will be fine. Well, my, my father is 95 years old, and I really want to go visit him. He's in Georgia. Where? Georgia? Georgia? Yeah. And my mom is 89 and I just haven't seen them in about it. Well, quite a while now. Yeah. I'm going to the same thing. My dad is nine, just turned 94 or is it 95, 94, I think. And, uh, he's in Florida. I haven't seen him for over a year. Yeah. It's been tough. Just adding some little highlights here on top of this cliff. So we know that it's a, that, that it's a cliff back there. And we have to work on this here. This, if you look at the top of the painting, I've got some depth working between this grayer area and this darker, richer area, plus these little highlights. If you look down on the right side, that's working pretty well with the sense of this being closer and that being further. But where you start getting confused is in this whole area right here. So usually at this point, after I've started making these kinds of basic adjustments, I want to sort of hammer in on the area that's got the most difficulty. What brand of uh, paint do you use for your Prussian? I use Gamblin uh, pretty much exclusively. I like their paints. They work well together. Um, I like their color range. 
some somebody pointed out that some Prussians are actually mixtures of other colors mm -hmm. like cobalt blue and copper mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the Thalos, but some uh, the originals were made out of I think arsenic. Yeah, I think so, and that hence the poison. <laughs> That you don't don't put it on your potatoes. I'm guessing. No, no. Now I've been trying to go with the more uh, less toxic paints. I've used cadmiums and all of that for quite some time, but uh, I don't know. I just feel like why risk it? There is a difference though in handling between uh, things like the Hansa paints and the um, um, the cadmiums. Sometimes I think the cadmiums are so bright that uh, they can get misused anyway because the tendency is to want to just leave them as bright as they are. Right. And what about whites? What do you use for a white? I've been using a titanium zinc white. It's a mixture. It's um, like the best of all worlds. Uh, the problem with titanium white by itself is that it tends to... Uh, well, it's very opaque, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but I find that sometimes it's a little too dense in the tube. So I have to mix it with some medium or something to make it brush a little better. Um, the other option I've been using is zinc white, which um, tends to be more transparent, but a little looser. So I don't have to mix as much medium in with it. I will tell you a story about zinc, though. It seems to get more transparent over time. Huh. I was up at up, up at my island studio, Campobello Island in New Brunswick, Canada, and had some beautiful beach roses that I wanted to paint. And I don't know why I took the zinc out with me, the zinc white, but I did. And, uh, you know, those things got transparent over time. Those little rose blossoms I painted just finally disappeared yeah. on the painting. And I had to go back and restate them with um, titanium White. Well, we have to we have to be careful about those things too, because uh, you know I think there's a famous Vel Velasquez painting where there's a an extra leg on a horse that came through over a few yeah. hundred years, yeah. and I know I was painting something the other day, and I had a bunch of darks, and I started painting lights over it, and I thought, you know, that's probably going to come through in a in a few years. Well, we just hope that whatever happens happens after we're long gone. Yeah, so so they don't want their money back. <laughs> exactly. Sorry, guys, you bought it. That's it. <laughs> hello, just, just... Uh, hello, India. Welcome to India. I just got asked to judge an art show in India today. That's pretty cool. Cool. Hello, Mexico. Yeah, I had two what? two art show judgings in twenty four hours. I don't know what's happening. You're on a streak. I don't know. Oahu, that sounds nice. Netherlands. Start to massage the paint a little bit here. That, and that's really, I, that, that's really nice that you did that. I was I was wondering if you were going to leave it that intense, and it's really great. It down. It's beautiful. Thanks. Yeah, I'm trying to, sometimes I'll start off with a little richer color than I, um, I want to go. And like I said, that's kind of my best guess. And I will step back periodically and adjust it to a little grayer or, or whatever it needs. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Getting exciting now. I can see it happening. Yeah, I can see it happen too. It is pretty exciting. Yeah. Put a little of this blue at the top of this rock just to indicate a little skylight maybe spilling down onto the upper reaches of it. If you guys are enjoying this, please uh, hit the like button or heart button or something. That's very helpful. And if you want others to see it, go ahead and hit the share button. Now, one thing I want to do is maybe hit this area a little harder because that is where the rock wall folds under and it's picking up some of this light bouncing into it. Um, so I think I'm going to take my knife again, which as we know, I have a hard time putting down. 
and mix them together a cool yellow and a cool red. So that's alizarin crimson and my Hansa yellow light. And just seeing it's too dark, a little more yellow to it. Uh, will you restate the, the, the colors you're using? Because there's some people who came in late asking questions about that. I'm using a, uh, a limited palette. So what I have for my yellow is Hansa yellow light. For my red, and I'm using two reds. I'm using naphthol red and also a lizard, a lizard crimson. And then for my blue, I'm using Prussian blue. And I'm also using yellow ochre, which is great for graying down colors. I love throwing an earth color in occasionally just because it, um, it helps you gray things down a little more readily than just using um, one of these more intense uh, mineral pigments. Do you always tend to paint in a limited palette now? I usually do. Um, I just find it easier to control the color harmony. And well, that's the big reason. It's easier to control the color harmony. Well, I, I find that when I do a limited palette, you, you never have harmony problems. But you start introducing, I have, you know, 17 colors on my palette. And I always fight that battle. Yeah. Well, I have a friend who... Um, paints outdoors with 40 tubes of paint, uh, which is a huge amount of color to take out in the field. Manufacturers but, love that, though. Yeah, but what he does is he only puts out the one or two colors he needs at a particular time. Uh, he doesn't lay them all out at once. Yeah, and that's, that's good. So that would get expensive. Yeah. <laughs> Just adding some little interesting rock textural things here probably too early for that but i felt like i need a little more definition in this rock wall so i know where it's where it's going yeah it's better one nice thing about this board too this absorbent surface um which again is hardboard with a couple of layers of acrylic gesso brushed onto it um i rarely sand my surfaces i don't like a smooth surface i prefer something with a little texture to it because you get interesting things happening like this uh, it's hard to duplicate that with a, just a brush and a knife. If you have a little texture, it works a lot better. Okay, so now we're just going to work in this area a bit more is to get a little more dark, shadowy stuff happening in this underside. If I don't finish this painting today, I'm so excited about it, I will finish it after the session's over. Uh, so and then you can post it. Yeah, exactly. Some advice for you folks who uh, may be in plein air conventions, or not, excuse me, not conventions, but uh, competitions. Um, if you do what's called a quick draw, it's good to do a test run before you actually get into the quick draw. So what I mean by that is uh, this morning, for example, I did a small version of this. I used uh, like a five by, you know, six by eight um, board and did a small quick version just to work on the colors to work out some issues. And that's an approach I've used at plein air competitions where um, you have, you know, 90 minutes or two hours to start, finish and frame and deliver a painting. It's a lot of stress, but if you can get there a little early and get a, a little test version out or a little study first of the scene you're going to ultimately paint, um, you are much more relaxed when the gun finally goes off and you have to start painting for real. Yeah. I don't know if you've experienced that, Eric, but I know I freeze up if I don't have a clue what I'm doing. <laughs> I never have. I, um, I, I have never been in a plein air show because um, first off, I'm not so sure I'm qualified, but secondly, I, uh, I don't want to compete with my customers. Oh, well, there you so go. I think, it, you know, um, it, I, I, if I did it, I would do it to be in the show, but not to sell paintings or mm -hmm. not, you know, just, just to paint along with everybody else, but not to compete for prizes just right. because I, I don't want to create a, an environment where people think I'm going to get some kind of an advantage because of the tide of the magazine or something. Right. I just don't think it's fair. Yeah. Hey, a little more texture, this rock area here. 
And uh, I think I need to just add a little, a little warmth up here. This got a little cold when I added that white to it. So we're just going to take some white and add a little yellow to it just to punch it up just ever so slightly. Now, is that snow up there? No, it's going to be sunlight. That's the hope. And from here, it looks white. Okay. I'll add a little more color to it. So it's... Uh, just do what you want to do. I just, just from the camera, it looked white. I like the idea, though. Yeah. I've been painting a lot of snow scenes lately. We've had, um, we haven't had a lot of snow this winter here at 7,000 feet in northern New Mexico, but we, in the canyon, uh, the snow lasts forever. It's in the shade. Um, and because the air is so dry, there's no warmth that goes around to melt the snow. So the snow just persists. And if I want to get away from things, I take my backpack with my gouache kit and just head out into the canyon and spend an hour or two just painting. Um, it's probably the greatest discovery I've made this because of the pandemic is just that it's just so relaxing to go out and do that. It's meditative and restorative and all of that. I love painting in the snow. I used to hate it, but <laughs> I changed my attitude and it made all the difference in the world. Mm hmm little texture down here let's bring this on through yeah so this is kind of an overhang and it's got some stuff happening where the erosion has happened and i'm going to take a little yellow and a little red and just kind of get this a little harder right in here so it's not quite that intense so i'm going to take my knife and just dab it a bit but there's some bounce light Okay, I'm pretty happy with what's going on here. So we'll move on down to this area and kind of resolve that a little bit. I've got these nice cracks going through. Um, like I said, it's important to keep that crack going through into the sh cast shadow because it gives you a sense that this is an object and this is something, well, it's shadow cast upon it. A little bit of a highlight here just to let us know that that little ridge has some shape to it as it goes into that shadow zone and i might take a little blue and a little lighter tint of the blue and just put on top of that it's a subtle i don't know if you can see that from where you are uh, but the idea is that this crack actually develops a ridge and the ridge catches light in a different way than what the stuff that isn't the ridge I don't know if I can say that again, but it's got a different form to it. There we go. So you can see a little bit of blue just kind of continues into the shadow zone. So lighter blue indicating that that's a different kind of thing happening. And I'll take some darker blue now and work into the cache shadow areas underneath those cracks. Just ever so slightly, just to let us know that there's some skylight bouncing down into those crack areas so somebody asked a question regina is asking do paints freeze or get thick when painting in the snow mm -hmm. that's a good question and um, i will say that you can paint when it's quite cold but i found that when you get down to about 40 degrees fahrenheit the paint starts getting a little stringy um kind of like mozzarella mo melted mozzarella uh, so what I do in that case is I might add a little medium to it. I've got uh, some Gamblin solvent-free gel. Here's a wad of it on the end of my knife. It's, um, it's great for making the paint a little looser if you have that situation yeah. where it's too... Yeah, uh, it's basically just linseed oil that's made into a gel. Um, yeah, that, you know, in Russia, they paint in very, very cold weather all the time. Mm -hmm. so they, all right. Uh, the white is always the biggest problem. White mm -hmm. tends to thicken up faster. Well, they take, uh, they carry a flask and they have vodka in the flask and they mix vodka into their white and sometimes their other colors because uh, it is eventually evaporates. But the other thing is um, that way you have something to keep you warm. You put a little in your white and you put a little in your stomach. Yeah, exactly. I've heard kerosene works too, but I wouldn't recommend drinking it. I don't think that's a good idea. You know, every I was reading the, uh, I think it was the Carlson book, 
on outdoor painting. And I think he was referring to painting with kerosene. I know that a lot of painters in Russia have used kerosene and some still do. Mm -hmm. okay. So you can see how we're developing this little rock area here, just to get a sense that there's a bit of slope to it. Nice form, yeah. And uh, there we go. And we need to do the same in the shadow bits. I'm just going to lighten that up a bit and maybe add a, oops, it's a little dark. So one, one of the things I'm curious about, um, you know, I, I oftentimes hear the, the idea of the principle of, of course, principles, rules are meant to be broken, but the principle of you want your darkest dark, the furthest forward, it looks to me like some of the cracks on the dark in the back are almost the darkest dark. Is that, I guess if you stayed a darker dark in the front, that'll make that recede. Is that right? Yeah. See this mark I put here. Yeah. That's it's a bit darker than what's back here. Um, and this would be an area I'd want to make sure that it had darker dark than that. If this weren't dark enough and I couldn't make it any darker, I'd definitely go back and lighten some of that uh, yeah. area a little bit. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing I think people struggle with. I know I do is the idea of, of stating values as things recede, you know, because is a dark as dark? I know things get, you know, bluer as they go back, uh, and, you know, less yellow, but um, that's that's always a, a struggle for me. Yeah. yeah. Well, there, there are several different things to, to that you can address when you uh, are looking at aerial perspective like that. And, um, you know, color gets, gets uh, grayer, and cooler it goes as it goes off the distance. Uh, values get lighter, dark values get lighter. And you can take those five or six different rules and you don't have to actually uh, obey them all. As long as you've got most of them working for you, you can reverse that. So for example, if I wanted, if I worked this correctly, I could make that a darker value back there, darker than anything else in the painting. And it would still work if I paid attention to the fact that the richer colors would be forward, the grayer colors would be in the back and so on. So if you have a list of five things to make something look distant, you don't have to do all five things. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's, that's what I found. So you, I was got putting, about, uh, you got eight or nine minutes left. Okay. Um, I just put a little stuff back here to make that look interesting. So now let's go back to this tree here. Now I'm going to move to a brush. And this will set up the scene and we can see what's happening. It's not dark enough. I'm just taking some yellow ochre and some Prussian blue and getting a nice, interesting green, I guess. But, um, it's darker, not as dark as that. Let's mix a little of this gel into it so it's not quite so, um, there we go. It flows a little better. Take a little red bit down here. It's over here too, so you don't forget about that little bush. You know, Tito's Vodka is here in Austin, Texas. I should contact them and have them come up with Tito's Vodka Solvent for winter. I like that idea. But and it's it. Eric's <laughs> Vodka Solvent. <laughs> Put it in a tube, it'd be even better. That's right. Vodka in a tube. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I was talking to Cheap Joe from Cheap Joe's Art Supply, oh, yeah. and he told me about the whiskey painters. Oh, yeah, the whiskey painters. And the whiskey <laughs> painters would paint in cafes, and they would dip their brush into their whiskey. So I guess I, we just come out a whole with a whole line of, uh, of uh, whiskey and vodka, margaritas. Yeah, I think we could – I think this might be a, a – good business idea there eric i'm thinking so yeah so maybe i should get out of this business and go into the <laughs> business no you can you can merge the two <laughs> well i think a, things would probably get pretty sloppy if i did that well you, well you can't drink your product that's the thing i just move some of this um color back in here break up the shape which has gotten kind of kind of massive I don't want it to be quite that ugly. Punch a few holes in. 
you guys are enjoying this, please hit the share button and a like button. It'd be helpful. Thank you. And tell us where you're watching from so you can win today's prize, which is a digital subscription to Plein Air Magazine, one-year subscription. Yeah, that's better. Getting closer. Okay, let's put in some little highlights here that are a little lighter in value, but still shadowy. Yeah. And then we'll have to go back in with some of the lighter yellow. See how these glow? I haven't put any extra paint on those areas yet. Um, yeah. Really still just uh, bare. Um, well, the untoned canvas with a little transparent yellow paint on top of it. Well, I tell you, if you're going to do that, you've got about four minutes left. So maybe okay. maybe this will be a good time if you're going to do anything else with that. All right. I don't okay, mean to be, uh, be a, uh, driving you hard. Well, hello, Nairobi, Kenya. Welcome. Hmm. And South Africa, welcome. Now I'm just taking some Hansa yellow light right out of the tube and just putting little bits and pieces of it here, kind of messing around with it so it merges a bit with the... Uh, um, the green that's there, so it greens it down a little bit. Mumbai, welcome. That's nice. And if you like thick paint, this is where you can start putting thick paint on. And if that's too, too yellow, we'll add some green to it. Some now, would, when you were fin when you're finishing this painting, would you go back in and thicken the paint everywhere, or would you just do it in certain places? I probably would keep the um, the paint in the shadowy areas uh, thinner, and then um, put thicker paint on top of these light areas. Like this paint here is fairly thick. That little highlight, wherever I have a highlight, I might do that. Uh, so, for example, if I wanted to put thicker paint on top of this sunlit green area, I can add a little white to it. And hey, there's a nice little passage just to make it lighter and even thicker. Mm -hmm. But still leave some of that um, stained glass-like effect there. Okay, a little bit reflected sunlight on top of that and this area here needs a little bit more development but i'm not going to worry about that just yet that's my afternoon project after i have my lunch every artist needs an afternoon project what are we having for lunch today uh, i think trina made some stew she'll probably tell me i was wrong but i think it's a stew she made mm. we prepared the cooking i made uh, omelets yesterday i make breakfast and she makes lunches oh that's nice That a little bit over here. Don't care too much about the uh, detail. It's more just about getting some sort of a random effective light and shadow. Uh, we have a question from Ruth who says, would you get the same kind of effects if you were using acrylic paint? Well, that's a good question. And I'm going to have to let an acrylic painter answer that because okay. acrylic in a long time. Um, Somebody in the comments will know the answer to that. Yeah, well, that's a good question. What, why don't we do this? Why don't we have you come back on camera so we can see your your uh, handsome face? Okay, I'm going to rotate right. you around. Nice job on that. Thank you for doing that. Um, terrific. Very nice. Thank wow, you. you got, it looks like you got a big studio. Well, it's uh, it's a big room. We okay. we needed to move closer to the router because we live rurally and we have. Not oh, a great internet connection. Not in your studio. I see. Love to show you my studio sometime. Okay, it's about the same. Good. About the same size, actually. Okay. Well, uh, we'll do that sometime, Michael. Thank you so much. I want to encourage everybody to go to his website, uh, which is mchesleyjohnson.com. Also, want to encourage everybody to check out his book either at the website or on Amazon. 
Uh, the latest one is Outdoor Study to Studio. Uh, take your plein air paintings to the next level. And uh, you're a great instructor, and we're looking forward to seeing you at the plein air convention. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. And we 